of you who don't know Bus Users UK particularly well, um, I think it's important to, um, to tell you that we are responsible for a, a range of bits and pieces of legislation, not all of which are to do with accessibility. Uh, I mean, I think the one that possibly most of you will know us for is our role under trading standards um, rules and legislation, um, because all traders are required to have something called an alternative dispute resolution body, which is a registered one. Um, now, if you if you don't know this legislation, it basically means that you need uh, an alternative dispute resolution body, or an ADR for short, to save the teeth. Um, if your customers are not happy and they complain to you, and you answer them, but they're not happy with your explanation or they want to take that further, then you are required by law to have an ADR body that you can refer them to. Um, and there are lots of generic ADR bodies around that you could use, uh, but bus users happens to be the only one registered as a specific bus and coach um, ADR. Um, I know quite a lot of people get a bit confused by whether or not the bonded coach holiday scheme is an ADR. It's an excellent scheme as an insurance scheme and it deals with a lot of issues, but it isn't a registered ADR. So just be aware of that because uh, you don't want to get into trouble with anybody by saying, yes, we've got this and that's an ADR. It's not the case. Um, I know there's been confusion with that because we've had that uh, conversation a number of times. However, if you do want to find out more about that side of things, then please come back to us after this meeting. Um, or just have a poodle around on our website, www.bususers.org. There's plenty of stuff in there that might be of use. Um, the second lot of legislation that we're responsible for is the passenger rights in Bus and Coach, which is possibly the worst written piece of legislation I've had the privilege to comb through. It's a mess, it's really confusing. And it's not that um, helpful. And it probably won't concern you that much if you're an excursion company. Um, it, the only thing that really affects pretty much every operator is the need to have a published um, complaints access or comments access for passengers right at the beginning of the journey and during the journey. So you should have that on your tickets, on your correspondence with passengers somewhere. If they're not happy, this is what they do. Uh, other than that, unless you're a really long distance operator, then you're probably not gonna need it. But because it's so confusing, we've actually um, got a quick guide for operators on our website, just to give you an idea. We've got it there for passengers and for terminal managers too, but the one that might be of interest to you would be the operators one. Um, the newest legislation that came into force and the most relevant one to this particular session, I guess, um, is the Accessible Information Regulation. And I think this is the one that's causing a bit of consternation. Um, but I think in terms of coach operators who only operate excursions and don't operate any express services or, um, or publicly available buses, local buses, from with their vehicles, you don't need to worry about this too much. Even if you do operate those services, you've got plenty of time to get up to speed with that. We take the complaints on it and we will do the negotiating through with DFT, the Office of Traffic Commissioner and DVSA. So if you need to know a bit more about that, please get in touch with us and we'll give you a bit more information. It's a fairly easy bit of legislation to read. So if you need a link to that, we can, again, offer that one if you need it. However, um, it's mostly about having audiovisual information on vehicles. And while it's not required for coach operators only doing excursions, I think um, it's useful to maybe check what they're suggesting so that next time you're buying a vehicle, you might want to check what's considered good practice with that so that 
if you can sweep that up into your next purchase without spending a fortune, you might as well do that because it will give you a little edge. Um, however, I think the phrase that maybe um, causes the most confusion and concern across the industry everywhere um, is when people are asking about things which are reasonable adjustments under the Equalities Act 2010. Now, a lot of companies just go, well, what does that mean? And there's an awful lot of um, hard work being done by the words reasonable there and proportionate. So if you've got a wheelchair user that really wants to go on one of your holidays, but they need you to have a wheelchair lift on your coach and you don't have one, it is neither reasonable nor proportionate to say to you, well, go and buy a coach that does or retrofit. That's not a reasonable adjustment. That's a very big expensive decision to make. So that's not what we're talking about. Um, I think what maybe you need to look at is to basically talk to the passenger. If somebody's saying, I'd, I'd like to know if you can make a reasonable adjustment to help me take part in one of your holidays, excursions, whatever. So it might be something as simple as reserving the front two seats for them, or four seats if there's lots of them, um, and saying, yes, I can do that, because they can make their way up the steps, but they can't stagger down the length of the coach as well. It's just too much and makes it too unpleasant and therefore inaccessible. Um, very small scale things you could do to make a trip accessible to passengers with some form of disability might just be like giving verbal directions to where the seat is, if their vision is not great. Or where's the loo? How do I access the loo? And giving quite clear directions. And I think um, what you need to be aware of is that your reasonableness needs to start at the beginning of your interaction with the passenger. If they don't have internet access, what's known as the digitally excluded, that's a big deal for a lot of companies trying to sell products like holidays and excursions to folk. The other thing you might want to check is whether your online information, if you have it, doesn't really scan very well for a screen reader. So if you've got lots of um, not very bright contrast, or you've got lots of pictures that overlap the, the words, it's going to be quite hard for anybody who's struggling to read your screen. But there's plenty of free advice out there on how to make your um, make your websites a bit more accessible. Now, even if you can't do much of that, you can make sure that your team members offer to print off the information that people want and post it to them. That's not hard work. It's not expensive. So print it out in black and white rather than trying to print it out in multicolored stuff. But make sure it's a very clear contrast. So if you have printer cartridges are running out, replace them before you start doing this, because don't send stuff out that's a bit gray and white, because that's not going to help matters. And we'll probably put people off forever. Um, your staff also need to understand that if somebody is hard of hearing, like me, then it makes a big difference if they can see your face when you're trying to explain stuff to them. So if somebody offers or asks for you to WhatsApp them or FaceTime them, and you don't normally do that, or your staff are thinking, oh God, I look like a mess today. I don't want to be doing that. Then they're not asking it so they can judge your fashion credentials. They're asking so they can see your face normally and maybe understand you a bit better that way. It can make life a lot easier and people feel heard when you do this sort of thing. Um, they may not want to say, I don't hear very well. Some people are embarrassed about their disabilities. Um, they shouldn't be, but they are. So if it's feasible to do what people ask you to do, then really it's a question of just being customer focused in that sense and trying to help. So if somebody's asking you for some support to help them make the most of your products, just ask them how. 
and say, I don't, I can't promise anything, but I'll do my very best to find a way to help you. And that way they know they've A, been heard and B, been respected, that their needs are of importance to you. Um, if they do book with you, please make sure that the driver, the all important member of staff for anybody with a, a, an accessibility need, the driver, please make sure that they and any other relevant staff, if you have tour guides on board, etc., cetera, um, really know what's needed and are very well briefed so the person doesn't have to keep explaining themselves. Um, and then they need to know as well what you promised will happen. Because if the sales staff are great at getting people in through the door and then the frontline staff don't deliver, then that's really going to bust people's confidence. And if you if you want people to be regular bookers, then they should be able to know that you live up to whatever you're saying. Um, so, yeah, make sure that your drivers go that extra mile. Most times, I think coach drivers are the ones that give people the best holiday and the best excursion and the really good experience. And if you give them the confidence to say, this is what we're doing and this is what we've promised, then they'll be able to make sure that that experience is just as good for people with an accessibility need and go above and beyond like they generally do. My brother was a coach driver for many years. Um, he's the lunatic that had to do a 380-point turn in the um, Mont Blanc Tunnel, if you've ever heard that story, um, because he realised he was going to run out of fuel. So we got a huge round of applause when he managed it, but the police and customs were not thrilled. Um, but it's always a good idea to know your customer, and an accessibility need is just another element of knowing that customer. So it, it, it doesn't need to change your business model. It doesn't need to cost a fortune. And when we move over to Victoria and Dave, David, sorry, um, then they'll be able to give you a bit more practical information on that side of things and the rationale and the why. Um, but I think all of us are going to have an accessibility need at some point in our life. So we all need to know how to make the best of it for people without necessarily breaking the bank. I hope that makes sense as just a general introduction to why it's important for us, um, because we are an accessibility and inclusion charity, um, particularly based on Bus and Coast. So I'm hoping that that might have ticked a few boxes in your mind or given you a few ideas. Hopefully you'll get a lot more practical stuff later on. So I'm just gonna hand you back to Lydia, who's hiding behind our logo. Um, and let you move on to the next topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. That was really interesting. In terms of the things that you were signposting, those documents, I will be able to send that those links out to everybody directly, along with a copy of this recording, uh, probably early next week. Um, so yes, very exciting. Next, I am handing over to David Nye, who is Ops Manager, uh, Spirit of Sussex Coaches. And I understand, Dave, that you also do some driving now and again. And also talking to Victoria Garcia, MBE, who is the Accessibility and Communities <laughs> Manager over at uh, Brighton and Hove as part of the Go Ahead group. So they're going to talk about some very, very specific strategies and also be talking about as well the benefits of doing this and they've got some fantastic ideas i've already had a sneak peek thank you very much again thank you so much for that thank you thank you lydia and claire so i'm victoria garcia i'm the accessibility and communities manager at brighton and hove buses and metro bus and also that means that the coaching department which is our spirit of sussex is also comes under the umbrella of brighton hove buses as well so um, David, who works in coaching, one of our leaders in coaching, he's going to share with you a couple of things in a moment as well. But mainly around the fact of once David's spoken, he's mm. going to share with you what we've got in our fleet about how many vehicles are, are got the wheelchair accessibility and how many don't. 
but also an antidote about the driver, really leading into what Claire was saying about the fact of accessibility and the things that you can do to be more accessible. And then after Dave has spoken, I'm going to go through some information on the purple <coughs> pound um, and the spending the spending value behind accessibility and just a couple of little things that don't actually cost anything but just the changes and what can be done to make it more accessible for your customers so i'll just pass you on to david okay so good afternoon um i am the operations supervisor for spirit of sussex so i deal with day-to-day -day running of the business um and so our fleet of vehicles we have currently at the moment 16 on site uh, one on its way down to us, which will make a 17th vehicle. Um, we currently have 13 of them wheelchair accessible, one being a very small minibus. Um, and we have two that are non-wheelchair accessible, but they are due to be decommissioned very shortly. Um, and one vintage bus, which obviously, for obvious reasons, cannot be wheelchair accessible. And what do you use them for? So we use them for many, many things. We do school, day-to-day -day school trips. Uh, we have school contract work, uh, which two of our current routes actually use wheelchair accessible vehicles for. Um, we do, oh, I'm trying to think now, you've caught me off guard. Um, you do lots of days out? Day, yeah, the get... day trips we do. Um, sadly, we don't do anything abroad um everything's in the uk uh the day yeah so we do day trips the school trips mainly most private hire stuff and yeah it's just the school contract work um that we do and uh, david actually is got something that when it leads on to accessibility david as well as being um, leading with all of the drivers. David actually goes out and drives himself. And one of the things that we have very big, uh, which uh, which um, which we all do, is around the customer and customer experience. Sorry. So the, with, the, with the real driving force is really the driver themselves. I mean, um, we've had a lot of compliments from more the elderly groups with the accessibility side of it, but um, with drivers helping people on and off the bus making sure they're comfortable before the driver sort of leaves the pickup points um and yeah we we seem to get a lot of good feedback for from the customers for the drivers based on a lot of the accessibility side of it um with yeah people struggling to get on and off the bus um and our drivers always on hand to help with that sort of thing OK, no, and, and that's what's really important. And I think that it leads into what Claire was saying before, that as, as David quite rightly said, the real driving force is the driver themselves. There are some vehicles that are wheelchair accessible. There's some vehicles that are not wheelchair accessible. As you know, I mean, for questions later, David can be talking about all the, the different types of vehicles they're using for different jobs because of compliance and things like that. But, but actually, at the beginning, it's your driver right from the start that will actually ensure that that journey is accessible. And also from the booking, going back to what Claire was saying as well, from the time you take the booking, if the person needs any extra help, if they need information printed off, if they do need to FaceTime, all of those things matter. So I'm going to just go into the wider side of things on accessibility. And, and on my screen, I've got sort of four different things that says one that says why, what does accessibility mean? Does it make a difference? Who cares anyway? And why does it matter? And I'm just going to answer those those questions on this presentation. And everybody on this call today, we all know that transport, buses and coaches is all about people. It's about providing them access to their work, education, healthcare and social interactions. And of course, that really matters with coach bookings and holidays and days out as well. These social interactions really, really matter. And good transport links are vital in bringing people together and can really help 
um, combat isolation and loneliness. So going back to what David was rightly saying about a lot of the, the customers and, and some of our customers, we, ca we, we have customers of all ages, of all accessibility requirements, but within coaching, we do tend to, apart from the school contracts, do tend to have a clientele of, of older customers that have more <laughs> accessibility requirements, which is why the accessibility matters even more. So at, at our company, we have this sort of theory around the fact of that where, where accessibility is actioned and, and a little bit like the way we think about health and safety as well and, and, and who's responsible to make the service accessible and why. We, we look at the fact it's, it's us, bus and coach operators, and we go back to the very simple things. It doesn't have to be about the design of the vehicle. It could actually be the fact of the driver themselves. Are we ensuring our drivers are trained? Are we ensuring the person answering the phone is trained to make sure that they're giving the right information? the manufacturers are we encouraging our manufacturers we're the customers buying these vehicles are we ensuring the manufacturers are giving us the vehicles that we need to be able to give it to the customers what they need and then of course local and national government come into it with the way that the mandate things and actually enforce every area so with accessibility, with an aging population, we, we're going to know that more and more people are going to have an accessibility requirement. And we all know, everyone on this call as well knows, that retrofitting a vehicle is a lot more expensive than getting it right from the start. And like ourselves, we, we buy new vehicles, but like a lot of operators, we buy secondhand vehicles as well. We don't just buy new ones. So when buying the vehicle right at the beginning one of the things we started to do on our bus operator side buying new vehicles is that we're really looking at the design of that knowing that if we don't get it right when we buy that vehicle at the beginning that's going to impact smaller operators 10 15 years down the line when that's being cascaded down to other operators and that's going to impact on their clientele as well so right from the beginning buying that vehicle and trying to make it as accessible as possible it's not just going to benefit us and our passengers it's going to benefit future operators in the future and future customers so we all we all have a responsibility to make it work and again i'm sure you're all aware of the inclusive oh, yeah. transport sorry Okay, no okay, hi. So, so the inclusive oh, transport well. strategy that came out in 2018, um, of course, again, there's lots of information in there that, that actually comes up on that, that to read through and, and the links on there. So there's a very clever man called Mike Adams, OBE. And if you don't know Mike Adams, I suggest that you go on his website, wearepurple.org.uk. Um, and he actually does um, the figures around how much the purple pound is worth. The purple pound is the spending power of disabled people and also their family and friends traveling with them as well. And there's actually um, an estimate, this is back in 2018, he's working on the new figures now post COVID. But back in 2018, there was an estimated loss to transport providers, to bus, train, and also coach operators at 42 million pounds a month by not being accessible, by actually not doing some, even the most basic things like ensuring that the driver is saying, how can I help? Or customer service saying, how can I help? So the purple pound, as I said, refers to the spending power of disabled households. Um, and there's lots of different stats if you go on the website, but 75% of disabled people and their families have walked away from a UK business, including um, transport operators because of poor accessibility and customer service. And the overall amount of the spending power is 274 billion just in the UK alone, um, the amount of money that is available. So if you think about that loss of 42 million back in 2018, there's a huge amount of, of income there from, from our passengers. And I'm, I'm disabled myself. And, and of course, I'm one of these people that actually look to see where, where I'm going to get my services from. But Claire said something very poignant early when she earlier on when she talked about the fact we're all going to have an accessibility requirement. And Claire is absolutely spot on, which is why she's a great ambassador um, working for disabled people at the Cabinet Office, because actually we will all every person on this call today is going to have an accessibility requirement at some point in their lifetime. That, that could be because they're disabled themselves, but it could also be because of the fact they've got a short term injury, could be they've broken their leg and they can't 
um, board the coach or the bus in the same way that they normally would. They could have actually broken their wrist and they can't scan their bus pass on, on a coach or maybe get their coach ticket out their pocket as quickly as they normally would. And things like carrying luggage. I mean, um, coach operators are great for that. We've got the great um, areas for luggage that are not on buses. But traveling with children, traveling with instruments, all of these things are all mm -hmm. accessibility requirements. So if the purple pound, the spending power of disabled people is worth 274 billion, what is the actual value of the accessible pounds? And, um, and in fact, going from um, earlier on, um, David showed um, a couple of pictures of some of our vehicles, but we've made some changes that are some very, very basic changes that don't go in. Ideally, we want all vehicles, of course, to be accessible, all vehicles to be wheelchair accessible, but that's not the case. And we all know as operators, we ourselves have a couple of vehicles that aren't wheelchair accessible on our coaching fleet. That's not going to happen. So it's the changes really that are the, the, the basic changes going back to what Claire was talking about that can really make a difference. So in our organisation, for example, all of our drivers, including our coach drivers, are all dementia friends, which we do in partnership with Alzheimer's Society. That actually, although we've got our CPC courses, which drivers do, you can actually um, access dementia friends through the Alzheimer's Society free of charge as well. Um, we've also got our all of our drivers are my guides through. We do that through um, guide dogs as part of our training as well. And we've also ensured that all of our newer vehicles, including our newer coaches, are all dementia friendly, dementia friendly flooring, which I'll show you a video in a moment about what that means. And in fact, here we are. This is. Oh, it's not actually oh, what I'm going to do. Oh, it is going to work. Here we go. <clears throat> well, this is about a bus. Our coaches are well as well. With her dementia. It is something she's living with. Shirley has got an amazing approach to life very very positive wonderful family support and a bit of an inspiration really well at the moment i mean i'm in my 80s and i'm doing everything i want to do even just to sit on the sit on the bus and, and do it and you're going to where you're going you know what you're doing and you're still you're still in meeting up with people that you know we live in this amazing city in Brighton and Hove and to be able to get out <coughs> and see the sea and visit the library and visit family members, it's just very, very important for people. It's nice that most companies put something in place and the people are friendly. They help, they talk to you as well on the bus, is it? which I think is nice. So all the drivers are dementia friendly, so they'll be much more patient. They know that it might take someone um, a while to find their bus card. They might be a bit unsure about where they're going. Often people with dementia, um, anything really dark and especially black can look like um, a pool of water or a hole. And of course, no one's going to step into a pool of water or a hole. So the fact that all the buses in Brighton and Hove have got light flooring, so that just removes that obstacle for people, which means they can continue to use the buses. Brighton and Hove buses have really paved the way for Brighton and Hove, so they're a fantastic example of what becoming the fact that dementia friends can do. So it's been a very motivating experience, I think, for all the staff, but also really improved their service for everyone. We're using Dementia Action Week as a launch for our Dementia Friend sessions. Our ambition is to make Brighton and Hove an agent dementia friendly city that works for everyone. When the general public understands about some of the symptoms, but also what they can do to make life, e life easier within our community. We're all stronger. You know, I've seen the difference that that understanding can make to people like Shirley. Oh, lovely. Yeah, I'll do another one again. <laughs> oh, it's lovely, yeah. <laughs> Let me go. 
Now, the reason I shared that is that although that was about a bus, as I was saying, that all of our newer coaches were ensuring that they're dementia friendly. And in fact, Brighton Host City Council speaking on there as well and, and the lovely Shirley sharing their experience. That's very poignant because Shirley refers back to the drivers are really friendly. The drivers are really helpful. And that's what really matters, whether it's a bus driver, whether it's coach driver, going back to what Claire was saying earlier, it's that point of contact. That's what can make all the difference. And in fact, Brighton Host City Council, I'm going to run into something in a moment about tenders, which will affect a lot of the coach companies as well. That really matters, which is why it's so vital that that the councils can see this as well. So we we as a, we are actually in our our operator, we've got the leader status under the DFT, which is part of the accreditation of the inclusive transport strategy. We've been considered leaders on accessibility, but that is not something that's not unachievable for everyone because the main reason why we've been given that status is because it goes back to that basic driver as David rightly said, the driver is the driving force. The driver is the person, your staff, your colleagues, they're the ones that can make all the difference. And, and I'm just going to move on to a couple of sort of other things because I know we're going to run out of time. But um, but what we've actually done, we've done some other things with, with, with our, not just our coaches, but with our buses as well, with the dementia friendly flooring. We've been looking at accessible signage, which I'm just going to show you about in a moment as well, which is something that you can really update, which again, can do without extra, extra costs and money. And we've also ensured that on the vehicles that are supposed to be audio visual announcements, we've added those and we've added destination <coughs> screens on our bus and coaches apart from we've got two coaches again if you want to ask David about that a little bit later on we haven't got on two coaches the white destination screens but if you are able to change your screens again if you're retrofitting we understand that's too much but if you're buying a new vehicle if you are able to update the white destination screens work so much better so I'm um, going to go into like our formula for success and about the changes that we've made, the small changes, which can make all the difference going back to the driver's driving force. And we actually have a three tier philosophy in the company, Brighton Hope Buses, Spirit of Sussex, and it goes like this. It's tier one. All of our senior managers and directors have the same disability and accessibility trainers, frontline colleagues. I repeat this session again and again and again and again and again. And the reason why I do, because it really matters and it really makes a difference. Because if the leaders understand it, if the ones with the checkbooks, if the ones making decisions in the boardroom, if the owners of the smaller coach companies really understand those very sort of things about accessibility, then then those changes are going to happen. And having that, that so Ed Wills, our managing director, within two weeks of him starting the company, he'd already done the My Guy training with Dementia Friends, accessibility training. It was one of the first things he did when he arrived. We have a dedicated resource. Not every organization can, can afford that, and we know that. So we have a dedicated resource on the screen. We've got Sam, who works with me. But actually, you just need a dedicated person. Now, it could be it's one of the directors. It could be it's like one of the senior supervisors, like David. It could actually be, be somebody in the industry that is responsible for ensuring that that your service is accessible and your it's just as part of their role. It doesn't need to actually be a direct person like myself or Sam. And what we've done is, and I, uh, I mentioned earlier about health and safety, in all of our businesses, health and safety is rightly mega, mega important. We all have to adhere quite rightly to those rules and regulations. We have what we call our change management policy, which you'll have yourselves, which you'll maybe call different names. But whenever you're implementing something, you will do a health and safety risk assessment, whether that's in a, buying a vehicle, whether that's doing something in the depot, whether that's an engineering thing, whether that's a policy, you're going to be looking at the health and safety around that. What we've done is we've taken accessibility and we've added it to our change management policy. So whenever we're looking at our health and safety, we're looking to see if accessibility is being thought about in our vehicle and infrastructure design, in our policy and processes, in our co-design with disability groups, because that person that you're going to maybe have that is speaking or going out, we actually link with disability groups. And I know we've got Sarah um, from one of the charities here today. We actually, the real people that can give you the real answers are the are disabled people and people with accessibility requirements themselves. So all of our marketing communications, all of our colleague training, everything goes through accessibility. 
And just as a, as a sort of really easy one, which is free for everyone, which is not going to cost you any extra money, and this came up during COVID for us, Everybody, when COVID hit, we all had to change all of our timetables overnight, reduce services, not so many people traveling on the buses. And just in Brighton and Hove alone, we had 3,000 bus stops that we needed to be regularly changing the timetables, sometimes every couple of weeks, which was impossible. So what we did was we went out to every bus stop, like a lot of operators, and we put up notices on every bus stop about how to access certain information and and for people with hearing loss for example we had we had a mobile phone that people could text to as well as having our customer services website information and very much what claire was saying about digital inclusion exclusion mm -hmm. sorry we, we that's why we have the um that's why we also had telephone contact as well but we realised on your websites, you've all got to adhere what Claire was talking about, about making sure your websites are accessible. That is a legal requirement to be with, with the WAG guidance. And that is what you're all legally complying to at the moment. We took that guidance and we've added it to our signage. So on the screen, on the we've got our old branding of Brighton Hope Buses, because of course we've just rebranded, but I've used this because this was during COVID. We've got our branding at the top, our old branding for Brighton and Hove. And then at the bottom, we've got our branding for Metrobus. And there's actual numbers on each of these colours. And you'll see there's double A on some of them. And then there's triple A on the others. Triple A is the highest accessibility contrast when you're putting together certain colours. We changed our branding very, very slightly on our signage to make sure we were triple A compliant. Now, I know Lydia will be sharing these slides. There is a free resource here on this screen, don't pay any money for. When you're doing your posters, when you're doing any of your designs, you can actually use this resource to check that if your posters are easier to read. And the reason why this is so important is because if you think about the fact of a design of a poster or any design of information, if less people can read that because it's not as accessible as being more with contrast, you're going to have less of your customers reading your information. So highly recommend that you go on this contrast checker and actually look at your poster designs. And we've also, and I think I've just put it out of order. Yeah, I think, yeah, no, here we go. I haven't. It's just because I was, I was changing the screen slightly. So we've actually got as well, I do apologize. We've it's one of the things as well is that we're looking at the fact that it's actually being accessible is the right thing to do, but it's also the commercially viable thing to do. And I referred earlier to the video of, um, of Shirley on the video and it had the council, it had a member of the council speaking on there. Accessibility, if you make your services more accessible and really thinking about those basics like for staff, if you can't upgrade your vehicles on the cost of adding ramps and different things, it actually will quicken your boarding times if the driver is there being more helpful and helping somebody on with their shopping or actually the driver's being more attentive and yeah. if somebody just needs an arm to lean on to help them up the steps, it's going to be boarding is going to happen quicker and that's going to shave time off your journey, which is actually going to increase uh, the commercial viability. But actually one of the things that's really vital now and it's actually it was supposed to have its own bullet point but when you're tendering for routes, when you're tendering to the council, when you're looking at funding from the Department for Transport, they're looking at whether your services are accessible as possible now, without question. And within your tendering applications, if you can be putting across the extra information you're ensuring your drivers have got, if you can be making clear that you're going out of your way to make sure that your drivers have the information and the training to help your customers, if you're laying all these things in line with what Claire was saying about you're willing to print information off and send it out, you're going to ensure that these extra things, which really don't take that much extra time and money, you're going to do. And that goes on your applications. They're going to see that actually you're doing more for accessibility that will help with your tendering. You're going to delight your present customers 
which will want to continue using your services. And what David was saying earlier about compliments, we have people coming back to us again and again and again for bookings because of what our drivers do and the fact of our accessibility. And they're always, they're our voice. They go out there more than the marketing department in many times and are actually sharing the information about what a great service we provide. And they're bringing customers to us. So you're, the community become our voice. And, and what can I say? Three key messages. Listen and learn from the lived experiences of, of disabled people and non-disabled people because they're out there and they're willing to give you their experiences to make things better. And Claire and Lydia and all the information they've got at Bus Users UK is incredible. And they're great advocates for doing it as well. Be prepared to commit to the changes. Ensure your senior managers have mm -hmm. the same training. That really matters. And, and remember, being accessible is the right thing to do, but it's the, also the commercial viable thing for you to do because it's positive for all passengers and for business as well. And any questions? Yes. Shall I unshare? Yeah, if I stop sharing, there we go. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So much information there. That was really, really fascinating. So yes, if anyone has anything that they would like to discuss now, we've got just about 10 minutes or so. Equally, if you would like to approach us because it's something that's sensitive to your organisation, after the effect, if you want to, uh, that you're more than, more than uh, welcome to do that for us either. You all a bit shy. I just want to say a little thing. That was a brilliant presentation, um, Victoria, and I learned a lot as well. <laughs> so um, really, thank you for all the efforts and stuff um, that you're doing down there. And I've, I've seen you present. It might be you or somebody else present in London at a previous meeting and what you were doing back then sounded really, you know, out there. And bus transport is, like for our members, it, if they can get to the bus because <laughs> the the stupid bus stops but, yeah you know they they can't ride a bike they can't drive and bus is independent travel for them so it's essential that they can get access to the bus so thank you for what you're doing no you're welcome and in fact with that as the claire and lydia know we're just doing a major audit of all of our bus stops at the moment we've just put together it, it took several months to put together about what yeah. does an accessible bus stop look like but we're doing an audit of uh, across all of our for exactly your say because it's already well making the coach or the bus accessible but the person yeah. can't actually get to the get on the bus because the stop isn't accessible or where they're going it's a very good point um I think there's been a lot of information that has been shared today. And if anyone has any other strategies, I'm sure it would be really very much appreciated if you were able to share them with your colleagues. But I also want to take the opportunity to thank our speakers for today, because you very clearly had done lots of research. And I think that we found it as useful as we did entertaining at points. So thank you very much. And I would also like to thank all of the participants that gave up your lunch break today on a Friday to come in and do that. And we will be following up next week with links to all the documents that we've discussed, a good link so that you're able to, to watch the video or to go back if there's anything that you want to be able to check. And, um, I am uh, wishing you all a happy National Coach Week next week. So uh, we look forward to seeing um, your bits and pieces on social media. Please tag us. We will share for you as well. So last chance for any questions. If not, I'm going to wrap up now. No, perfect. Happy Friday, everyone. Thank you ever so much. And in particular, thank you to our speakers today. And we will see you all soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.